how the hell do we deal with this? So when they approached Anne Alexander, people might know Anne Alexander, she's like the main person in Egypt, asked her whether she would be willing to go to America to bring them up to speed with what's happening in Egypt. And she was like, hell no. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to guess. You know, but there is the sense that they're completely at sea. They didn't expect this to happen. They had no idea how to do it. And now comes to Saudi Arabia. Um, I'll almost try and keep this right, I promise. But it's really important we understand Saudi Arabia as not being driven by the same uh, waves that have driven the other revolutions. Because poverty, neoliberalism, this was very important in Egypt and Tunisia. The unemployment, the cutting of the red subsidies, these were all things that were the triggers for the revolution. In Saudi Arabia, it's slightly different. In Saudi Arabia, what you have is an alliance between the Al Sauds, who are tribal. How they made their money before oil was storming into Syria and into Iraq and stealing whatever they could and coming back. I and mean, this is essentially what the Al Sauds were. They were camel raiders, brigands, yeah. essentially, and who now took control of the oil. When they took control of the oil, they made a deal with people called the al-Sheikhs. The al-Sheikhs were Wahhabi, puritanical version of Islam. They made this deal in, in, in the 1920s. We deal, the Sauds, we deal with foreign policy and with the economy. You have social control. So this is why you have in Saudi Arabia quite a modern, lots of ways very, very modern ruling class. But actually the, the state, the population is under extreme control and they can't break that alliance. They, actually, the Sauds want to break this. But they can't. They're, 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 far, they're far too scared. So when the revolutions happen, they can pump billions and billions and billions into the economy, anything you want, new house, new job, etc., etc. Um, the questions are social. Because if we think of the shift from the, you know, essentially the, you know, the, uh, uh, the countryside in, in Saudi Arabia in, into the cities, it's all these new questions. And so the question, so in Saudi Arabia, it's not the price of bread. It's a question of whether a woman can drive. Why is it important? Why can they not just simply give the right to women to drive? Because that would be an important crack, a break in the control of the al-Sheikhs, of the Wahhabis who control the internal. So we understand in Saudi Arabia being very much social, very much social changes that are driving it rather than economic. Economy is, is important as well. Looking east in Saudi Arabia, it's in a state of continuous mm -hmm. uprising. The main issue, people say it's Shia, but it's nothing to do with that. It's, 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 it's an extraordinarily wealthy part, part, part of the area, and, and it's infected very much with it. And you talk to the Saudis, we meet so many Saudis these days, um, and they talk about the revolution in the mind. And they're, they're so well educated. Now they talk about the kind of form of German idealism that is taking hold inside of Saudi people's heads. And people try to. I'll try and make this short, but Germany lost its revolution in 1848, and so the revolution happened in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So German philosophy became very, very important. You see this in Saudi Arabia. They can't really go into the streets, they get into big trouble, but in terms of their shifts in their consciousness, it's really quite breathtaking. I, I, I met a young Saudi student studying accountancy in East London University. We were having a long chat about the revolution as it was developing. He said, oh, come back, we carried on to have a chat, and he was in full Saudi regalia. We went into his room, he had pictures of, he had pictures of Che Guevara everywhere. You know, he said, oh, you know, Jesus, I'm an atheist. And you're like, oh, my God, who is this? <laughs> like, you know, you know, and, 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 this is where I, and this is what he was telling you. It was the question of women, the question of the girls. Do the girls get education? These are the real key questions. So you see, actually, the dynamic in Saudi Arabia is being different to other places, but the same, because it's part of the same process that is, that, that, that is, that is taking place. And, that, and that's really important. If I could go on raging in Saudi Arabia, I won't uh, uh, otherwise. But, 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 but just to give you a sense of this tension, that we think of the Saudi king as being completely reactionary bastard. He is, don't get me wrong, that actually in Saudi Arabia he's a progressive wing. Because he, when the question of women's vote, which is very important now, the right woman to vote, is very, very important. He did a ruling which absolutely shocked the system, which was women were allowed to vote, not only were they allowed to vote in the municipal elections, they were also allowed to stand in the municipal elections. Okay, okay, great, what difference does it make? The ruling was they're not allowed to be accompanied by any male. So this is a very significant, so it's like, it seems minor to us, it's a very significant social break. It's acknowledging the rising power of women in Saudi Arabia, and now saying women, over the electoral process, women are not allowed to bring the men, because they have to take men everywhere. At this point, they have to leave them in. There was like a shock in Saudi Arabia. People talk about the progressive king. I mean, we don't see it that way from outside. But you have to understand there's been these tensions. So it actually means there's all kinds of cracks appearing everywhere 
and, and so on. It's something else about the Saudis you should know. They pile into Lebanon every summer um, and are worse than the English. They get completely drunk, you get into fights with all the Lebanese. Um, and, so, and so this idea that there's still these kind of desert raiders doesn't really work anymore. They're very well educated and, uh, and, 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 and very worldly and, part, and see themselves as being part of these, uh, of, of these Arab, Arab revolutions. Just, just on the question, very quickly, on the question of Palestine. I'm not going to have time to do Syria, unfortunately, otherwise you'll be here at least another hour. But, 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 but just on the question of the Palestinians, now, what we have to understand is that, the, that there is, we, we, we call it the three pillars. There's three pillars of the regime, uh, three pillars that held up the regime. The first pillar was the social contract. So depending which part of the, part of the Arab world you were in, there was some kind of social contract. So even in Egypt, you get free education of some sort, might not be very good, but you're guaranteed free education, you're guaranteed some kind of pension, and bread is subsidized, so is travel and various other things. Neoliberalism destroyed all that. So that happened across the Arab world, even in Syria. Neoliberalism has destroyed that thing that kept people just above starvation. Mm. You're just above starvation, don't make trouble. As long as we're not dying, we can hope for the future. Suddenly you're starving. Actually, this makes a big difference. So neoliberalism was the one thing that removed that social contract. The second pillar was the question of Palestine. In order to placate the Arab street, generally over the question of Jews and Palestine, they promised a two-state solution. The Americans promised a two-state solution, the Israelis promised a two-state solution, and the Arabs told us, the Arab rulers, told us this is what they will deliver. So the Oslo Accords, all that has to do with Palestine will accept two states, we won't accept Palestine from the river to the sea, we won't accept the return of the refugees, etc., etc., but East Jerusalem at least will be the capital of the Palestinians and they'll be able to go from West Bank to the Gaza Strip. This was the promise. This was Oslo. Actually, they lied. And in 2001, I was working as a journalist in Beirut. The Arab League, the present Saudi king, he was the crown prince then, came with the chit to the Americans and said, we've all agreed, two-state solution, everyone's on board, deliver. And the Israelis and the Americans went, no, we're not. What the hell? And there was this shock that went through. You know, it was like, we knew they lied, but they were so blatant about it, it just became almost unbearable. And the second pillar, that pillar of Palestine also collapsed. And I remember it being very significant, is that you saw people's heads drop. People just kind of went down, and it was just like, we're weak, we're useless, we accepted their promises, they promised us two-state solution, nothing's happening. In fact, there's an acceleration of the building, throwing people out of Jerusalem, all these kind of things. And so the question of Palestine then was, I remember the, the, there, there was an, anal an analyst in, in, in Washington, one of these neocon, neocon idiots, um, who said, if the, if the Arab masses did not rise for Saddam Hussein, they'll never rise. And you're like, well, actually, there's no Arab who's going to rise for Saddam Hussein. They hate them. That's the truth. But they will rise for the Palestinians, because the Palestinians, they believe, has been the people in struggle and so on. So I'm saying, just a thug. Really, no one was going to come. Uh, no, no one was going to come and help him. So that, the, the Israelis are now find themselves at sort of almost blackmailed by the kind of more rabid Zionist element that want to grab more and more sections of, of, of the West Bank. The two-state solution has collapsed. There's revolutions all across the uh, all, all across the Arab world, and so the control of the Fatah, which is the main Palestinian organisation, has now collapsed, and the control of Hamas, the main you know the, the main organisation in the Gaza Strip, has also collapsed. So what you have now is the coming together of Hamas and Fatah against the Israelis. I think there's problems with it, we can talk about that maybe, maybe some other time. If you're an Israeli and you look at Hamas and you say, where did Hamas come from? It came from an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood. Hmm, Muslim Brotherhood, who are they? They just won the elections in Tunisia, they're about to take control of Libya, and they just won the elections in Egypt. And if you want to look at Syria and all the rest of it, there's the Muslim Brotherhood. So for them, they're now no, no longer simply looking at Hamas, they're looking at the Muslim Brotherhood, and that is huge. And so they're seeing it and there is this panic. So the sectors of the Israeli ruling class who are terrified and want to pull back and then but being, being caught in this, uh, in this trap of, of being at, 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 at the mercy of settlers. And it's really interesting. I, I will finish on this. Because we always say, it's one of these things, we always say, don't look for the solution of Palestine inside of Palestine and Israel. Palestine is too weak to do it. Faced up with the Israeli military, I think it's impossible for, for, for them to do it. And the Israelis have no compunction at all to do it. They can do what the hell they want, because they want all the walls and so on. And so you can look at that, you can go, 
okay, no solution coming from inside now. Where did we say the solution was going to come from? We always said the solution had to come from outside, from the revolutions in the Arab world. To understand the relationship between imperialism and Israel meant that you didn't have to go for the hard nut. You could throw out Mubarak. This is a big defeat for imperialism and so on. So that's began to change dramatically. And it was a beautiful piece um, by an Al Jazeera journalist who went to the streets inside of Israel and said, to, to find out how, how people react, Vox Pop, you know, how ordinary people are reacting to the fall of them, of, of Hashim Mubarak, our most important ally, and all this kind of stuff. And she was absolutely shocked. She said it was the most shocking thing. She said, they were suddenly going, hey, you know what the Egyptians done is right? Because, oh, I, you know, our rulers are completely corrupt as well. Maybe we should do that the same year. And she was like, what? Is this coming from the... And, and, and she describes that I went looking for a reactionary Israeli. I eventually found one in the shop that all the people were saying, what happened in Egypt has inspired us. And then you saw what happened inside of the social movement that took place inside Tel Aviv. Huge demonstration, <coughs> as being the main one. Don't look at that one, look at Haifa. Haifa's a mixed city, mixed Arab and Jewish. There was joint demonstration between the Arab Jews in there. And then you look at the poor Israelis, and you understand them as being <coughs> as poor now as the Egyptians. Really, I mean, you look at it and you see they're actually in a terrible... So, so actually things are shifting very, very dramatically. The problem is they come up constantly against Zionism, the barriers that Zionism puts up. And the, and, the, and the fences and so on that have to break. But it was, it was always this joke, we say, you know, um, and we, have, we also had a, a phenomenon of people, um, uh, especially the Kurds, but also Syrians and various others, sneaking from northern Iraq and so on <coughs> through Lebanon to jump over the fence to go into Israel. Why? Because A, they wanted to work, B, they were sick of the repression and so on. What we didn't have were Israelis trying to jump over the fence to come live in the Arab world, well, why the hell would they? Who the hell would want to live under a bus regime in Syria? You know, really, there's no attraction. So we always said there had to be the revolution, democracy, in the wider Arab world, at which point then you offer the Israelis, be part of this or not be part of this. This is, I don't know the answer to that, by the way, which way they'll go. But you can see the social tension inside of Israel and the way it can relate to the Arab, uh, the Arab revolutions as being possible. You can see the possibility now of it kind of emerging in a way that it wasn't before. What we... What, we, what I don't expect is the Israelis to go from Egyptians, because I don't think they'll uh, stand a, a chance. If they couldn't take on South Lebanon with its one million population, the idea of them going for Egypt with its 82 million population seems a less attractive. So you get the sense of this deep strategic distress, as they call it. Street, uh, very important the strategic distress. That actually meant the siege of Gaza is now pretty much over. It's not totally over, but it's pretty much over. And the pressure inside of Egypt now meaning that, that the Palestinians are, are in a completely different situation than they were a year, a year and a half ago. I think you have to understand that, 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 uh, that, 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 that generally. Uh, that, that generally. And the Palestinians themselves have been drawn in to the Arab revolutions in a really important way. And the only thing I will talk about Syria is the huge refugee camps that are in Syria have now become anti-regime strongholds. So people <coughs> escaping, especially from Homs and the Free Syrian Army fighters, Escaping the repression are now appearing in the Palestinian camps, and the Palestinians saying to the Syrian regime, "You're not cutting in here." So you can begin to see actually the way the, pa the Palestinians are beginning to engage in the Syrian revolution, in which they're engaging with the Egyptian revolution, and so on. And so all these things are are, are are in this massive kind of like massive change, weak imperialism, big revolutions. How bloody nice is that for us for a change, eh? Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Really.